Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone here today. My name is Tom Wright. I'm director of the Center on the United States and Europe here at the Brookings Institution. It is a great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon for a discussion on the legacy of 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the end of the Cold War. This past weekend, as everyone here knows, marked the 30th anniversary of the accidental opening of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, Following a confused press conference, East Germans rushed the Berlin Wall uh, and more than 140 of their fellow citizens had died trying to cross and demanded they be allowed through. Um, the 30 years since that night have been marked by incredible progress uh, toward this goal, um, but also immense uh, challenges remain as the European order is deeply challenged from both within and from without. Today's discussion will not only focus on the legacy of these events, uh, but it will also seek in, to determine what uh, this legacy means for the next 30 years of transatlantic uh, relations. We are fortunate to welcome such a talented group of Brookings scholars to the stage to discuss their takeaways from this momentous event. Uh, Jim Golgar is the Robert Boss Senior Visiting Fellow at Brookings and one of the most foremost experts on the subject of NATO and U.S. policy toward Russia since the end of the Cold War. Victoria Newland is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings and also a senior counsellor at the Albright Stonebridge Group. She served as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs from 2013 to 2017, and she was a key architect of President Obama's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My colleague Constanza Stolzenmuller is, uh, uh, is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Um, sorry, slightly uh, out of date by a week there, but uh, and an expert in Germany and transatlantic relations. She is currently on leave at the Library of Congress uh, to write a book. And she has also just written a fantastic essay on her personal reflections on 1989, which I highly recommend to everyone and which we'll discuss uh, here on the panel um, in a moment. And you can download that from the Brookings website. And finally, we're delighted to welcome Susan Glasser of The New Yorker uh, to Brookings uh, to moderate the discussion. Uh, Susan uh, is the author of the book Kremlin Rising uh, from her time as a correspondent in Moscow and also is the author of a forthcoming um, book um, next uh, uh, spring, summer, on James Baker. And few people have the depth of experience and perspective to tackle this issue like Susan. So thank you for joining us uh, today. In putting together this event, we are thankful for the support of the Robert Bosch Stiftung. This event is part of the Brookings Bosch Transatlantic Initiative, or BBTI, as we call it, which aims to expand our networks and work on how best to further transatlantic cooperation to address global challenges. Uh, so now to leave plenty of time for conversation, um, I will also join the panel. I'd like to ask the panelists up here and Susan uh, to, to begin the moderation. Thank you. All right. Well, Tom, thank you so much uh, for that good introduction. We're going to embarrass Constanza more by shamelessly flacking more for her essay uh, called German Lessons, uh, which I do highly recommend as well. But I think it's also, I mean, it's, it's a great starting point for, for any conversation uh, to think that it's been 30 years. Clearly, uh, we're all too young for that to have been the case. Let's Absolutely. just stipulate totally. that. Exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> nursery 10. school yeah. was very big on uh, the fall of the wall. Um, but when I think about you know, the range of foreign policy challenges, uh, you, you quote Timothy Gartnash in this essay, Constanza, talking about this, this night of wonders. In many ways, it was a year of wonders, uh, and then some, a year and change okay. of wonders, uh, one that it's, it's hard even to convey to a new generation who has spent the last decade plus, you know, immersed in a constant drumbeat of what appears to be, uh, you know, revanchism and, and bad news, uh, to convey what it was like to grow up or to be in a university setting, uh, graduating, moving into the world at this moment of great optimism, uh, you know, that's a, that's a lifetime foundational event uh, that I almost feel like even that itself uh, is worthy of a whole conversation. Uh, so I thought, you know, I was recently discussing this 1989 Year of Wonders with someone who said to me, you know, 
it was probably the best year of our lives. We just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> Uh, and so I thought we might as well start out, you know, with a sort of uh, foundational moment, you know, question about that, you know, because we all carry those assumptions and those experiences of 30 years ago with us, I think, as we're talking about the unbelievable challenges, not only in Europe today, but also in the United States in terms of how we even think about Europe 30 years after the end of the Cold War. Uh, Costanza, we know what you were doing uh, on that night, courtesy of your essay. I don't want to spoil it, but it turned out you and I were in the same place, although we did not know each other. Well, yeah. Um, can I just first make an acknowledgement? Uh, I am here because of the really excellent quality of the double-layered thermal underwear of a very well-known New England brand, without which I would not have survived three Massachusetts winters. <laughs> I, did, I did get pneumonia at least once, but you know, I, am, I made it through. Um, but yes, that, that is exactly where I was. I was going to graduate school um, and really thinking that I didn't want to go back to Europe. Uh, I had left a Germany that I thought, and a Europe that I thought was hidebound, depressed, uh, I thought the political atmosphere was polarized, was leaden. Um, we were the second largest generational cohort to come on the labor market. We couldn't explain to our parents who had been sucked up by the labor market in the late 50s and early 60s that it would be very hard for us to find a job now, no matter how good we were. And a lot of us had fled to other countries to go to graduate school. And certainly those of us who'd gone to America thought, you know, we're totally staying here. And this whole baggage of, you know, European depression, the end of growth, uh, the, the end of sort of the upward mobility, well, we want to get rid of that. And in fact, some of my age cohort did do that. But, but as, I, as I wrote in this essay, you know, I was completely caught off guard by the wall coming down. Of course, I had, you know, because I had been flying back and forth to Europe because of an illness of my mother's, I had, I had grasped the importance of what was happening in Poland and the Czech Republic. But I think all of us thought the East Germans, you know, were going to stay there forever because the East Germans had always been the best communists in the entire Soviet bloc. And even the Soviets thought that. If you look at Mary Lee Cerati's book, um, about the, the, the collapse, um, historian who's now at, at, at SAIS, uh, she, she interviewed a number of the people who were actors at the time, and there is a, um, a Soviet policymaker from, from the Kremlin who went to East Berlin to talk to the Hanukkah government, I've forgotten his name, and who came back saying, you know, these guys are geriatric, uh, they're so rigid, it's impossible to talk to them, um, and frankly, they were insulting to me, we're just, you know, they're going to have to deal with this. And guess what? Guess what? It happened after all. Yeah. yeah. One thing I was struck by was the, the extent to which, for you, it really was even almost a question of an identity that you weren't ready to take up in some ways as a, as a sure. German. You said, like, you know, you, your, your, your gaze was not eastward into East Germany, uh, you know, that, mm. that in some ways uh, it was as far away for you as Arkhangelsk or, mm. you know, Siberia. Yeah. Well, the, the part of that was generational and part of it was personal. Um, the generational thing was that for many of us, you know, we had literally grown up with the wall. I was the same age as the wall. And... Um, while the official policy of, the, the, of West Germany was to not relinquish the notion of eventual reunification, de facto what we were doing was rapprochement with East Berlin. And Ostpolitik was a very careful balancing of our membership in NATO and finding a modus vivendi with the East Germans and with the other, other Eastern Europeans. And frankly, the assumption was this was going to be there forever. Yeah, it, was, it would never change. And then in my personal case, um, you know, I had no family on the other side of the wall, unlike others that I knew. Um, I was going to a really conservative, hidebound law school in, in Bonn, the capital, at the time. And some of the um, you know, guys from families that were, whose fathers were politicians in the CDU who were revanchist and who you know, would give speeches in the Bundestag saying we want parts of Poland back. Mm. And I wanted no part of that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I kept a, a long distance from these guys. And also, of course, you know, my law school teachers were the star students of men who had been deeply implicated as, as jurists during the Third Reich 
in the um, maintenance and the building of, of the Third Reich and its killing apparatus. And um, I found that to be profoundly offensive. And I remember, actually, I went home my first Christmas. And the other thing, I was, a, I was a foreign service brat, so my parents were outside the country. And I went home my first Christmas to Madrid crying and saying, listen, uh, this is all too horrible. I, don't want, I want none of the historical baggage. And also, they're all really right wing. <laughs> and and, you know, they're, and, and, the, and the, uh, the ones who aren't are always in the streets protesting against the Pershings. And it's horrible. And my parents said, you know, sorry, we don't have the money to send you to America or to England. If you don't like it, go back and change it. <laughs> yeah, but, um, and I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to uh, America, and I, and I thought, this is my escape. I am never going back to this. This is all too awful. Yeah, so it sort of gave you Germany yeah. back in a way that you, know, yeah, you couldn't have anticipated exactly. at that moment. Yeah, and yet, uh, Tor, I want to come to you, because this, this expectation that, you know, that even Constanza had of somehow we knew it was both unsustainable and yet we kind of felt like it would go on forever. That was kind of the Cold War. You were just starting out as a, uh, in, the, in the Foreign Service as a young Soviet expert at this time. Absolutely. So I come into the Foreign Service in late 1984, speaking Russian. So the Foreign Service, in its wisdom, sent me to China. <laughs> As we do. And it, it took me, you know, five years to make my way back into the Soviet business. Uh, and so I was on the Soviet desk, 1988-89, uh, an amazing Soviet desk, in fact, as we go back and think about it. Sandy Vershbau was the director. John Teft was the deputy director. Steve Pfeiffer was the external chief. And John Herbst was my boss in the economic section. Um, so, all names, if you've had anything to do with Russia over the last two decades, uh, you've, you've run into all of those people. Yep. All went on to be distinguished ambassadors in probably a total of 10 countries and shapers of the post-Cold War response, I would say, and, and mentors. And so did you. Thank you. But there, um, but but, there was the, the... But interestingly, you know, my, our response was a little bit different because the, sure. the summer before that, I had spent... Uh, you know, we, we obviously were watching... The Balts rebel, we were watching the, what was happening in student movements. I'd written my thesis on solidarity, which to me felt like the beginning already back in 1979. So there was this maybe naive, youthful hope that we would live through a period where there would be an opportunity to have a real relationship with all of these countries, and particularly for somebody like me who'd gone to university and fallen in love with Russian language and culture and, and wanted to have the opportunity to build a better world together and not have this hidebound system between us. Um, so on our Soviet desk, which was, again, 88, uh, we were working with Bob Zelik, who had the portfolio to work with, um, with Gorbachev on perestroika and to see if we could support this economic opening. Now, what we thought was going to happen was that you know, you would, uh, like folks who, who oppose the embargo to Cuba, that somehow if you did more trade, that lifestyle would begin to change politics and that the economics would be the driver. We, we didn't imagine that politics would be the driver. But on the other side of the desk, we were also doing a huge amount of uh, arms control then. It was the, you know, completion of the Reagan mandate and um, the CFE treaty and all those kinds of things. So there was a sense of real promise with the Soviet Union even at that time. But more importantly for me personally, I had been on the first team uh, to open our new embassy in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia <laughs> in the nine months before that, so before I got to the Soviet desk in 88. And the experience we had there, uh, you know, none of us knew the country, none of us knew much about it, so we sort of did that first political and economic mapping we were an embassy of two. I was the junior member of the team. I was the political officer, the economic officer, the cultural officer, the defense attache, um, and the junior GSO. Uh, but the way we worked it, my boss at the time, Steve Mann, uh, was talking to all the leaders, and I was talking to all the young assistants to the leaders. And those younger folk were beginning to say, we want what is stirring in Central Europe. We want change. These guys are giving us nothing. 
and we're going to fight for it as soon as we get the chance. So you could feel in our generation already right. mm -hmm. this incredible hunger. Um, yeah, That's a great story. And so just on the question of Germany, though, and the fall of the wall, you mentioned Zelik. He would keep... Uh, for months afterwards, after the fall of the wall, he, he famously kept a memo from the European uh, Bureau that, that you would go on to head many years later, uh, saying basically everybody wants uh, reunification and nobody thinks it will happen in, in our lifetime, uh, that it was not something that expert sentiment you know, had, had called. Yeah, I mean, I think the first question was whether... Germans actually wanted it, mm. which mm. comes up quite clearly yeah, absolutely. in your essay, Constanza, <coughs> where mm -hmm. you're, you've sort of been looking at each other warily. There's a lot of complex poli politics and history, generation to mm. generation. So I think what, you know, we didn't assume that it would happen anywhere near as quickly, but of course, mm. um, being who we are or perhaps who we were, the minute uh, the Germans themselves said, we think we can do this, we want to do this. We wanted to be the major support, and, and, and as right. is well known, it was yeah. not an easy decision for the UK and France to support, mm. so I think mm -hmm. we were important to that conversation, but the German people and the German leadership on both sides mm. were the essential factor. Th that said, I, I think we uh, have to acknowledge in retrospect that none of us had any idea what we were taking on. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, Helmut Kohl, the, then the chancellor, famously said, um, you know, this, uh, we will have blühende Landschaften, blooming landscapes in, in eastern Germany, and it won't cost us a penny. Um, and we've, uh, I, I, if I were still paying taxes in Germany, uh, which I don't because I live here, but um, I would be still be paying the so-called solidarity tax. Um, and in, in the end, it, it, I mean, it, it has been a huge effort on all sides. And arguably what we're seeing now in both the economic, the demographic, and the political data uh, coming out of Germany and Eastern Germany and the regional elections there shows us that this is still very much an ongoing effort and that there, we're still excavating you know, problems. Uh, in fact, in, in, in many ways, uh, there is now literature about uh, the economics of reunification or about the politics that we, that literally took, I think, three generations to tackle. Yeah. I mean, there's this one young East German author called Christian Banger who's written a very moving piece called The Baseball Bat Years, Die Baseball Schläger Jahre. Um, where, he's, where he writes about the endemic violence in the villages and, and in the cities of East Germany, where you know, suddenly the, just the, the caretaker state had retreated and, and all hell had broken loose. And, tries, and people are now trying to understand why that happened and, and why, you know, why it's still feed, feeding into electoral politics to this day. And, and I remember, as I wrote in the essay, very vividly as a junior reporter at a daily in Berlin called Tagesspiegel, being sent to cover a neo-Nazi thug trial you know, and seeing these you know, young neo-Nazis sort of lolling around in front of the judge and the prosecutor and thinking, wow, they're clearly trying to prove that they're unimpressed. And then afterwards, I head out with my notes to phone into the paper and I see sort of these busloads of guys converging from both sides with baseball bats mm -hmm. and proceed to chase each other around the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beating each other up. Essentially, the outbreak of politics that yeah. I, neither side really, you know, had any framework for Inkling thinking about exactly. because it was Precisely. so new. And which we ignored and denied. For yeah, well, time, it's interesting. It's almost like, a, to me, that scene you're describing is actually very similar to something I experienced in uh, the southern Iraq city of Basra in the mm. uh, 48 hours after the yeah. departure of the Saddam regime. You know, something very similar, which was that there were thousands of people in the streets in protest marches, and you realized the, these underground political factions had immediately, you know, come to the surface. This group was allied with this group in Iran, this group. And we, and I think probably the U.S. government, had basically no idea about this eruption, this volcano of suppressed political activity exactly. uh, that would come to shape uh, this place in ways we barely understood. Uh, that and the former Baathist generals that were sitting at home doing nothing, uh, <laughs> beginning to plan the, the resistance. Yeah. Um, Jim, how much did 
do you think the the incredible heady but also disorienting experience of 1989 to 19 19- 91. How much did it shape, uh, you know, this current generation of American foreign policy thinking? I mean, this was, you know, how much did we embrace a narrative at that moment and, and a series of choices that we're still living with right now? You know, was that was that your perspective that that was this foundational moment, or did you think history was over and you made you made a disastrous career choice? <laughs> well. I mean, in terms, I, I actually, in, in uh, the fall of 89, was on the academic job market for the first time. I was finishing my dissertation, and, uh, and right about the time the wall fell, I did actually get a job uh, at Cornell University to teach Soviet foreign policy. <laughs> I started there in January of 91. I taught it for a year. That class moved over to the history department, and <laughs> I, moved on, the history. I moved on to other things. <laughs> But I think the power of that moment for American policymakers really came through the pro-American, pro-Western sentiment Mm -hmm. that was, you know, clearly there across Central and Eastern Europe, the desire to be part of the West, the desire to, you know, have what America had. And I think that that proved incredibly important Um, In the early 2000s, you mentioned Iraq. Uh, You know, a lot of the people who were in the government during the time of 89 to 91 and saw the reaction from Central and Eastern Europeans were in the government in 2003 thinking that, you know, the Americans would be greeted as liberators in Iraq uh, and that we would repeat the story there that we saw in Central and Eastern Europe. And all you need to do is let people be free, and they pull down the statues, and and, and they want to be part of what we've got. And I know it's just a very. You started to, your remarks today by just noting the, the incredible optimism of the time and the optimism, uh, about what people thought of us, um, which, as you mentioned at the outset, for a younger generation would seem rather perplexing today. (laughs) That's right. Well, in fact, my own experience of uh, that night uh, in Berlin was I was doing what college students do, and I took a nap, uh, (laughs) which one does in college, and woke up two hours later to see a security guard uh, at the front door of our dorm with a small TV that had suddenly materialized on his desk. This was not a guy with a TV normally. He was just shouting over and over, you know, oh, my God, oh, my God, what is it? And this palpable sense, once I figured out that, you know, World War III hadn't broken out, that, you know, when do you go to sleep in one world and, and wake up in another world? Uh, it's just not an experience. But, of course, Tom, we could have had an alternate narrative of 1989, which was the story of Tiananmen uh, Square and in the rejection of democracy, uh, which arguably is one of the grand stories of the time, the Chinese choice from that same year. And yet, clearly here in Washington in the U.S., we embraced a different narrative. You know, for us, it will always be the first month of the Arab Spring, uh, you know, that that moment in time. Well, without without skipping too far ahead in our conversation, there was one man, as you know, an American who looked at what happened uh, at the fall of the wall and sort of regretted it and would later say that it was a shame the Russians did not respond like China did in Tiananmen Square. And he is president of the United States today. So uh, it wasn't a uniform welcoming. <laughs> you know, Tom, you had to bring that up. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I can't possibly resist. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't um, me. <laughs> uh, but no, you're right. Bar that one person, I think uh, Americans did uh, see this as a very positive um, development. And of course, you know, the, the Soviets weren't uh, willing to pay the cost in blood that it would have taken to, to put that down. I think that is not something you know, that we can take for granted when we look today at the around the world where there still are sort of authoritarian regimes. Most of those regimes, I think, would behave in a very different way if they were challenged. And what it shows, I think, is that it's really partially the, 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 the mindset of those dictators or autocrats um, and how they would sort of respond. And while, while obviously that was a very evil regime, I think the choices that they made um, at that time were very... Um, significant. And I think, you know, when we look back on it, and there's 
a lot of discussion now about whether or not that legacy has been frittered away or whether or not it, it has been somewhat of a disappointment. I think we got a very good sort of long period of time, you know, 30 years, 25 years, um, by historical standards is, is you know, a, a very long sort of era and to have been guaranteed that level of sort of democracy, peace and prosperity in Europe up until, I guess, you know, around 2014 um, or so is not nothing. So I think as we look at the challenges uh, today and all of the problems, you know, I don't see that as sort of a repudiation in a way of the legacy of 1989. That's just, you know, the way history evolves. We will always have new challenges, you know, and problems. But I think they would have been, and this gets to some of Jim's work, but I think, you know, had different choices been made by the United States and by Germany and others after the fall of the wall, and those problems would have probably been much worse. Like, I think actually, for the most part, the policymakers um, did really well on consolidating uh, the gains from that pretty uh, amazing moment. You know, it's very interesting, actually, because if you go back uh, and, you know, read it all into that time, as I'm sure was interesting for you, Constanza, working on this essay, the big debate was not Russia, which is our conversation, and I'm sure we'll shift to that now, uh, you know, and how it would feel about uh, the reunification of Germany and the collapse of the wall. But it was really, are we going to somehow unintentionally set ourselves up for the return of the German question, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, having been the dominant theme of uh, European security uh, debates over the previous century and a half? Uh, And in fact, it was, you know, Tori, you mentioned it was the... um, uh, you know, the British, Margaret Thatcher and the French, uh, who were the most concerned uh, about a, a fast unification of Germany at this time. And, you know, I, I'm curious, Constanza, like, did you find or, you know, as you sort of excavated uh, that period, uh, to what extent do you think the questions about uh, Russia were answerable? It's like, you know, Putin has a narrative about this moment. Uh, that has become foundational for him and his grievance. Mm. Uh, what is your view about, you know, whether that was even a, a relevant discussion at the moment? I mean, obviously the Soviet Union still existed uh, in November of 1989, mm. but it was also clear that it was in dire straits. Mm. Right. Well, obviously the German question is my favorite question. Um, <laughs> I could... <laughs> uh, any, all of us Germans ask ourselves that, and we're going to ask ourselves that for the rest of our lives, I think. But um, I think at the time, it was in these sort of heady, triumphalist days uh, and, and months and years after reunification, the idea was, um, this is a problem that we've solved. Basically, what had become apparent in the negotiations with Gorbachev and the, and the Kremlin w- was just how decrepit uh, the Soviet system was. And part of that was seeing, negotiating with the price for the withdrawal of Russian troops from Eastern Germany. Yeah. We paid the, the Russians billions, I think, to move them all back and basically um, to construct housing for them mm-hmm. back in the Soviet in Russia, Union, yeah. mm-hmm. and then took over the empty bases. Mm-hmm. And it became clear that these poor people had lived there under really miserable, impoverished conditions. And that gave us, as it were, a tangible insight yeah, into just how decrepit the whole system was. And, and so I think the policymakers of the time can probably be forgiven for thinking, you know, they are going to spend the next de- decade, um, you know, resolving their own issues and, and maybe they will come our way, hopefully. Yeah. And with somebody like Gorbachev, who was much more amenable to reasonable conversation than the geriatric um, regime of the GDR. And keep in mind, one of the, the, the last minister president of the GDR is still alive, Egon Krenz. Mm. And um, some of the German press has been going and interviewing him and portraying him. And he has clearly learned absolutely zip. Um, <laughs> there is, he's about, I think he's 83 now. He was in his 50s at the time. And... Um, and, and one of the quote, one, my favorite quote from one of these recent interviews is, well, nobody complained about East German prisons before 1989. <laughs> well, no, 
you know, because they would something much worse would have happened to them. It's I find this astounding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the how has he spent his thirty years? Um, I think he's probably, you know, there is still the matter of the, the um, shall we say, not inconsiderable financial assets yeah. of the GDR regime, which is, has not been resolved. And I suspect that, you know, I don't know, there must be, there must be funding somewhere. Hmm. I'm going to put that very carefully because I don't actually have sources for this. But this is, but this is one of the unresolved questions post-1989 of of the of the dissolution of of, of the GDR, so um, you know, in some ways, the, the 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 Soviets appeared to be younger, more willing to accept change, more willing to change themselves. And remember that what Gorbachev was doing was was truly extraordinary. If you had like me, grown up with you know geriatric old fogies like uh, Chernyenko and Andropov. I mean, Gorbachev was a miracle of reasonableness and youthful energy. Yeah, and certainly compared to Arihonika, who at that time was, was more or less, you know, I think in, in, on his way into, into dementia. And, and Egon Krenz, his successor, the guy I've just quoted, was, you know, just um, so much more provincial and hidebound you know, than, than certainly Gorbachev or, or Raisa Gorbachev, who, who, you know, made a furor wherever she went, including with the Reagans, yes. But by the way, I do want to make one point, which I just, um, I have yet to read it up, but on, on this weekend, I was sitting uh, at a dinner with uh, Phil Zelico and, and a bunch of other people who made a policy in the, in the day, and Phil has just written another book. He was, I'm sorry, he was the uh, d- director for, for, for Europe policy in the White House um, at the time, and was instrumental in the negotiation of the two plus four um, agreement, which um, which led to German reunification and full sovereignty. And Phil has been going through the through the archives and said something which I did not know, which is that Reagan had had a second conversation after his famous speech in Berlin in 1987. Mr. Mr. Gorbachev mm-hmm. tear down this wall. He'd had a he had had a later conversation with Gorbachev in which he told him. You know that maybe maybe taking down the wall hadn't been such a great idea after all. <laughs> so that's and Phil found that in the files. Again, I have to I have to read that up. But but that is to say that we genuinely benefited from a moment where everything came together and everybody decided to be enlightened, mm-hmm. which is why in my essay I, I say this is a moment of amazing grace, mm-hmm. yeah. which I mean was a deliberate theological reference because amazing grace and I'm a Lutheran you know, is something you, you know, that sort of comes to you from above and you haven't really done anything to deserve it, but you go run with it. So, Jim and Toria, I want to bring you guys in then on exactly this question of, uh, you know, did we do something right? Did we screw something up? Uh, you know, were we just lucky? George H.W. Bush famously is, you know, shown the first TV pictures of uh, the fall of the wall uh, and, they bring the TV in and they bring the press pool into the Oval Office because they recognize it's a historic moment. And uh, I believe it's Leslie Stahl says to me, Mr. President, you know, what do you think of this? And he says, well, you know, I don't want to dance on the wall. You know, don't want to be too triumphant. No victory dance here. And he got a lot of criticism. Uh, trouble for that. Uh, you know, for days, in fact, uh, they were wondering, you know, does he not process human emotion? Does he, you know... And, but it's, it's a good question. You know, restraint, in effect, was the American policy at this moment. Uh, and yet, at the same time, uh, in the 10 months of negotiations that followed, they were very firm on the idea that Germany was going to be in NATO. You know, sorry, guys, but that's, that's really how it's going to work out. And that was an un- unyielding uh, American goal. There was a lot of questions which Putin has raised about uh, Jim Baker and whether he uh, promised them not to move one inch eastward. But I'm, I'm curious. What, what does Jim Baker say about that, by the way, having spent a lot of time with them well, in the recent he, months? Season? You'll have to read our book is okay. the long answer. The short answer, though, is, uh, look, there was no agreement with the Soviets uh, about this. This was not the American negotiating position. And, of course, both the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union were still in existence at this moment of time. So to contemplate a future without the Warsaw Pact on uh, Germany's borders was not the world in which this negotiation was taking place. Have I represented that <laughs> correctly? Um, so, but I want to ask both of you. I mean, you know, so tell us what, I mean, I'm just a college student. I'm watching this historic moment on TV, and I'm thinking freedom. 
you know, you guys are much savvier. You're looking at this and is NATO the first word that popped mm-hmm. into your heads? I mean, how is it that that became the West's predominant policy response to this? So I think it's really important to um, understand for people like George H.W. and those around him, uh, and this would be true again in the uh, Clinton administration that followed, the lesson of the 20th century for those American policymakers was very, very clear, which in its most simple form, post-1919 bad, post-1945 good. In other words, the United States left Europe at the end of uh, the peace uh, after World War I, and two decades later, uh, there was another world war. Uh, and in 1940, after 1945, the United States stayed engaged in Europe uh, and helped uh, a peaceful and prosperous Western Europe uh, develop and thrive. Uh, and they, they really feared that if the U.S., under p- domestic pressure, were to leave Europe, that that would... Um, that that would create havoc uh, in Europe. And there were a lot of Europeans uh, who felt the same way, especially in the midst and the immediate aftermath of, uh, of German unification. And I think they, they also saw this as an enormous opportunity. Again, you know, Central Europe as the origin of two world wars and a Cold War, uh, the opportunity after the end of the Cold War, George H.W. Bush had talked about a Europe whole and free when he gave a speech in West Germany in May of 1989, you know, it's sort of this opportunity. Oh, my gosh, like, we now have this opportunity to fix this darn continent once and for all uh, and uh, really try to create uh, a more peaceful landscape, uh, which provided the impetus for uh, NATO's enlargement across Central and Eastern Europe, provided the impetus for American support for European Union enlargement uh, across Central and Eastern Europe. And, you know, from the standpoint of of that thinking, uh, that was an enormous success. The problem was, uh, how do you find a place for Russia in all of that? And that proved uh, to be uh, a lot more difficult than I think people uh, recognized until much later. I would, I would just pick up from there and remind that the second big project that was going on on the continent from, depends how you mark it, 86, 87, was Gorbachev's effort to transform the Soviet Union Mm -hmm. itself Mm -hmm. and to open the system to make it more free to start allowing public debate, to start allowing free enterprise, all of these things that seemed unthinkable themselves. And I think in the White House there was some concern that you didn't want to solve one problem and make it that much harder for Gorbachev. So I think for us... The first issue was, would would Gorbachev tolerate all of Germany in NATO? And I think he was, frankly, so focused on saving his own nation, which, you know, he obviously achieves on one front and doesn't achieve on on another, given what happens to the Soviet Union two years later. that He was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But also he understood the practicality almost before London and Paris that you couldn't take Mm -hmm. half of Germany And for us, you couldn't have a NATO without Germany because it was the knitting of Germany in that was the purpose of NATO in the first place. So the the physics and math of it didn't allow for any other option. The question was, how could you assure everybody that it wouldn't be a hostile NATO, that it would be a purely Mm -hmm. defensive NATO, and that it would actually give Gorbachev a little bit of time to withdraw his own troops uh, quietly, which he knew he had to do because he couldn't afford it. Um, And in fact, it was this bizarre boon to his restructuring of Soviet power that the German side paid for bringing all those folks back to the the Soviet Union because it wasn't obvious that Moscow was going to be able to pay for and do that. He ended up having to pay for pulling them all out of the Baltics and all of that, which was a, a strain on the budget at a time that they couldn't. So we were trying to balance a couple of things. And I think once Moscow said, yeah, yeah, we're focusing on our own garden, just keep supporting our reform, which we all thought would be gentle and take decades, um, you know, it was it was a matter of walking and chewing gum at the same time. Right. And go ahead, Constance. Can I, can I interject something here? I think, uh, I mean, I, th- I think you're both right to emphasize and praise the tremendous restraint 
um, that uh, U.S. diplomacy practiced at the time. And I think there is a, a conversation where actually uh, President Bush, uh, you know, or a, a minute of a conversation between Bush and Gorbachev, where Bush actually says, you realize I was trying to do this so that you wouldn't get in trouble with all the, you know, geriatric old ideologues in, in back, back home. And Gorbachev says, yes, I noticed and I appreciated that. Yes, although... But, Sorry. But at the same time, what Russia also, that what in the Yeltsin era, what Russia experienced and what Russian civil society experienced was a wholesale dismantling of what they had come to think of as a nasty, decrepit, but still a caretaker state, yeah. and a sort of capitalist free-for-all in which, um, among others, German banks, you know, uh, basically went for the fillet parts of the Russian economy, yeah, and and the the sort of the animal was was opened up and and you know the hide was ripped off and and everything you know was distributed, and I think um, ordinary that that was the point when ordinary Russians began to think that uh, this was somehow that the West was attempting to to uh, roll them. As it were. Uh, well, two, two, there's two quick points. One, one, back on Bush's caution. I think when when Bush's caution gets in the way is two years later, mm-hmm. um, when there's the coup <clears throat> against Gorbachev, mm-hmm. and uh, Washington spends 22 hours trying to decide if it's going to be on the side of the coup plotters or on the side of Gorbachev. And I remember that distinctly right. because I was a baby political officer in Moscow counting, you know, the 250,000 Russians standing in the rain defending their White House and defending Yeltsin while my own government couldn't decide what side it was on. And that went to this fear of, you know, um, sort of chaos and loose nukes and all of that. So so that's the the tough moment, I think. Um, I was going to make another point about about. Oh, uh, but on the but on the Russian side, you know, I think there was and we can get into this if you want to. There was a profound difference in the liberating, if you will, or the liberation of countries that had a historic memory of free markets, Mm -hmm. of open society, of Mm. being European, of being economically knitted in together, if not Mm. politically, Um, you know, like like Germany, like Poland, versus countries that had been 70 years asleep. Um, with no political culture and a complete nanny state or mm-hmm. kleptocratic state or whatever, yeah. sure. and we, we we treated them all the same and and yes or they we they thought they could be the same as well and, yeah. and right yeah. and not just you but we also I mean the yeah. I, I think one of the problems in the in the past twenty five years has been the European Union applying the same framing. Yeah. Of, of transformation and a, v- a very onerous sort of uh, body of rules and regulations yeah. that um, some states made huge sacrifices to, 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 as it were, absorb, like the Balts, who joined the euro in the middle of the global financial crisis mm-hmm. when it was most painful them, for them at the cost of huge uh, sort of austerity programs, basically as, as another an added layer of political insurance against Russia. But the farther we, we got down, particularly when you look at the Romanian and Bulgarian accession in 2007, it was clear that these were very fragile political economies with a great deal of, of you know, fragile civil societies, um, fragile institutions, and where arguably, I would say, this imposition of these whole ponderous EU body of rules was an additional burden. Yeah, rather than a, a stabilizing factor. Well, I mean, you, Constance, you brought us almost forward to today. Tom, uh, Putin has said that essentially this period of time was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, the breakup of the Soviet Union, which, by the way, he experienced the very beginning of which in Germany at this moment of crisis when he is uh, a young uh, KGB officer in Dresden. And this is probably the most interesting moment in his uh, as told to you autobiography at the beginning of his political career, he describes uh, the crowds, the protesting crowds surrounding uh, the consulate uh, and the KGB building where he was headquartered in Dresden. No one is there. He takes charge. He gets them to be burning their papers while they're frantically cabling back uh, t- for orders. What should we do? And Moscow is silent. Uh, and, you know, this silence from Moscow seems to have been the, the defining moment for Putin's 
political career, he's made NATO his grievance. He's made it his narrative. Uh, Tom, do you think it still matters? I mean, it, it will, with the passing of the Cold War era of politicians, whether they be Donald Trump and, and Vladimir Putin or someone else, uh, you know, is this still even a conversation we need to be having about American foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. Um, I think for, for Putin, as you point out, it is the driving sort of motivation. And, you know, no one obviously knew about him at the time or throughout the 1990s, but that resentment built and it was part of a broader uh, resentment in Russia and it was a coherent, uh, you know, constituency um, that ended up very much making its influence felt. And, you know, when we look back on that, you know, we can forget sometimes that Putin is still a, a relatively young man. Like, he can be there for, I think he's, what, 67, mm -hmm. 68. So he could easily be in power for another, you know, 10 or 15 years. And we can have all sorts of discussions on what Russia's national interest is and, and how much it should have a rapprochement with the West and be worried about China. But I think in, in many cases, you know, it's Putin, not Russia, and his mindset is very firmly rooted in this period and what happened since. And I think that continues to define uh, how Russia as a state thinks of its national interests. And I think as long as he's there, he will have this, uh, you know, really uh, uh, almost pathological distrust um, of the West. And I, I think the other part of it is, is that as we look back about why um, those ideas of democracy and liberty may be faltered, at some point and are now on the reverse uh, in Europe and, and didn't take hold in, in Russia um, or in China. I think for people like Putin and also like Xi Jinping, you know, they actually understood, I think, the power of those ideas and that they could take hold and they determined to stop it, right? So they, they decided to proactively have sort of a Herculean effort to roll this back, Putin in, in Russia and in Europe and, of course, Xi Jinping in a very different way in China, but they, I think, were worried about that march of um, those trends, that end of history, those ideas of convergence. They didn't think that those were empty, and 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 they it required an effort on on the autocrats' part to push back. And I think that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing what Putin has always referred to as the snapback. You know, I think very much still um, in motion. But I think it is, as you say, sort of rooted in his experience of that of that time. Now, arguably, um, we have seen now three American presidents in a row who essentially have uh, either withdrawn their gaze from Europe or, you know, essentially taken a fairly dismissive view of uh, the degree to which American national security any longer depends upon uh, this. Uh, you know, you obviously uh, the form and the style is different from between Obama and Trump, and yet there is that through line. Uh, you know, the pivot to Asia, uh, as I well recall, as does uh, Toria, was not well taken uh, in, in Berlin or other European capitals. Tom, do you think uh, uh, there, what, how would you describe American policy? Uh, toward uh, Germany and the heart of Europe right now? And uh, aside from getting them to pay up, uh, is, is there one? Well, I think, the, I think the, firstly, I think, you know, U.S. policy towards Europe is usually driven by the threats and challenges rather than by taking the region on its own terms and looking at sort of the opportunity and the importance of having what George Kennan sort of wrote about in that very early period, which is healthy regional orders in Western Europe and in Northeast Asia, right? There's been sort of this notion that it's not really about that. It's really about what Europe can do mm -hmm. for us. And so when Europe, uh, you know, 10 years ago is not really a problem and it's not part of the solution, you know, basically there's this disinvestment in terms of expertise, sort of a focus in Asia, a focus on the Middle East. And that, I think, is sort of natural and at the same time, um, regrettable, but I do I do worry. Obviously, there's the Trump administration's policy uh, through these ambassadors or some individuals in the administration, which is quite hostile. Even if one sets that aside as an anomaly, I do worry that the burden sharing argument has totally distorted <coughs> sort of the U.S. view of Europe, right? Because um, because it's we're so fixated on this two percent number, and I do think 
Secretary Gates and, and President Obama deserve some blame on this too, that it's basically consumed everything else. And the real sort of, you know, challenges um, are sort of going um, undiscussed, you know. So it is a reality that Europe will bear more of the burden over time as the US retrenches in the Middle East. And they will have to cope with that regardless. But by focusing on this number, rather than on how they will cope with that contagion of instability, I think we're missing something um, big. So I, I think that there, there has been, has, you know, I, I think been distorted by that. But I think there is still, you know, the sense by some, and including people on this sort of stage, that Europe as a healthy regional order just on its own and it is an important U.S. national interest. Mm. And if that, that uh, is in trouble, then that will affect not just U.S. interests in Europe, but globally. Mm-hmm. Toria, if you got a do-over, uh, <laughs> would you get rid of... On what, you, the 32 years? Yeah, I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> but on, 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 on Europe policy right now, I mean, would you, would you say Tom is right and let's, let's not have this, this will, so let's not talk about 2%, let's um, try to frame it differently? I mean, it, was there any moment in time where we could have uh, avoided some of both the conflict with Russia and the bad feelings that clearly exist to a certain extent on both sides of the Atlantic? Well, there's the there's the Europe as in EU, NATO, Europe, and then there's the Russia question, and I think there are two different questions. Yes. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a little bit of an exhaustion uh, after the Balkan Wars where there was a huge amount of effort, belated effort, but nonetheless, and a sense that the rest of the world had been neglected. And so, you know, pivot was an unfortunate term. What we really wanted to say was to invest equally elsewhere, I think. But I also think that, um, you know, in in 2008, 9, 10, 11, an enormous amount of effort went into helping Europe come out of the financial crisis. But it was a very narrow uh, set of issues and a narrow set of players in terms of the other adjustments that a more integrated European Union was trying to make. And it, and there were vulnerabilities created both on the counterterrorism side and on later we find on the migration side by other aspects of the pooling of sovereignty that Europe hadn't yet addressed, Schengen and all of this, um, that we just weren't invited to be part of, we didn't think was part of what we needed to do. Um, And frankly, very few Americans, I think, understood in that period until later exactly how much Europe itself was changing, how much the pooling of sovereignty would change the way we needed to work together, change Europe's both opportunity for us and its But, you know, what what would I do now? I mean, obviously, uh, the free world is shrinking. The free world is under threat. The greatest concentration of friends and allies is on that continent. Uh, If we want to solve, you know, work on issues like China, work on issues like innovation, work on issues like ensuring an internet that favors freedom versus favoring uh, the authoritarians and totalitarians, Europe is our natural partner, as well as tackling the challenges we, we both have, like income inequality and how to, how to handle my, migration in a humane way that nonetheless stimulates growth. So uh, this ought to be a moment where we're holding Europe closer, where we're helping Europe to come together around its own solutions to these mm-hmm. issues. You know, when Brexit first happened, we were very much involved in, in 2016 in trying to ensure that the channel didn't boil and that the sides could come up together. Um, and then we sort of decided it, it wasn't it wasn't our business. Uh, so, but by the same token, I also have some some criticisms of of European leaders themselves, where when we leave the conversation or become in fact hostile to the conversation, as we have become now, on trade, on NATO, on defense, uh, I don't see any strong vocal champions for liberalism, democratic values, all the things that made us strong and free and prosperous together. You have Macron talking about multilateralism, but that's a different thing than defending 
uh, this free open system, mm. uh, and and frankly, standing up to some of the rhetoric coming from this side of the world, but but also reminding Europeans that they live the way they do because we all invested in this system mm. for 70 years. I want to see some European voices pick up the mantle if we are going to be as we are now. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, this, this interview that the French President mm. Emmanuel Macron gave this week in which he not only talked of multilateralism, as he often does, but actually said that NATO was brain dead, uh, both as a result of challenges to it from the United States, from, from Donald Trump, but also uh, uh, from within. Uh, so first of all, Jim, do you think uh, he's got a point? And, and do you think that NATO will still exist five years from now? Um, so, that, I mean, that interview is very much worth reading. The interview that Macron did in The Economist, uh, the, just the anger yeah. that comes through that entire interview is so palpable. And the, the brain-dead comment, which he makes at the beginning and then again at the end, and at the end he's very clear what he's talking about, which is very angry uh, at the lack of strategic coordination, especially with respect to the issue of Turkey and Syria. He talks about how you know, the United States, without consulting anybody, went ahead and gave a green light to Turkey, and Turkey said, okay, great, we get to go into northern Syria, and, you know, Turkey is a NATO ally. The United States is a NATO ally. Uh, you just see that, you see that anger. And, and, of course, he's been trying to make the case for a greater strategic capability within Europe, um, but he doesn't really have partners. And I think the problem with this interview is it didn't, it, it, it's not really designed in a way that would help him get partners. Uh, because, you know, for example, of course, the Germans had to respond, you know, immediately with their, you know, strong support uh, for uh, NATO. And uh, I think, you know, the, the um, I mean, we bear some responsibility for the level of European weakness that has existed. It was in part by our design. I mean, again, going back to the beginning of the end of the Cold War, uh, the post-Cold War period, we wanted to run the show in Europe, uh, and as we did elsewhere in the world. Um, so we didn't, you know, I, I think we made, a big mistake we made in the 90s was as Europeans talked about their own uh, security and, and defense uh, program, that we weren't more supportive because it kept worrying, well, what's that going to do to NATO? And in fact, we should have been saying, you want to do more for your own defense, that's great. That's, you know, we, we support that. And we, we didn't. We, we, we were ambivalent, you know. Occasionally there were moments where we supported it. And, I, I, and so you see him, Macron, uh, taking up this mantle of, I'm going to help to build this, uh, this capability. We saw at the beginning of the Trump administration when he started these conversations that, you know, then you got into this whole European army and Trump getting all angry about a European army and... Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, it's, it's really been a very unfortunate debate, but, but, but he doesn't really have strong partners to pursue his vision for Europe. And so Europe will remain dependent on the United States, I believe. And given the threat that Russia does pose, uh, I think that that will be enough to enable NATO to continue for some time. Five more years, uh, at least, you're giving it. Um, does anyone disagree with that? Just one thing on, on that. I mean, I agree with what Jim said, but I thought it was even worse in a way. I, you know, I mean, <laughs> if you look at what he said in Article 5, for instance, he mm -hmm. said, I don't, the the, mutual you know, defense I don't know whether or not right. it still applies and who knows where it will be tomorrow. The instance he cites for that is not the president's ambiguity about NATO, it's whether or not if Assad's forces mm -hmm. attack Turkish troops, presumably mm -hmm. in Syria, that then Article 5 will be exposed as hollow. But of course, Article 5 does not apply to that in the same way that it did not apply to U.S. forces in Iraq being targeted mm -hmm. by Iran. So it's the type of thing if President Trump said, we'd all be jumping on mm -hmm. him right. for being yeah. completely misleading. And then I think he sort of undermined the case for European strategic autonomy because his entire argument recently has been about rapprochement with Russia mm -hmm. and trying to bring Putin back in at a time when Putin has not moderated his ambition or his behavior. In fact, he is doubling down, it seems, on interference in the U.S. election. 
Yep. So it's just an incredibly strange thing, I think, for a leader of a European country yep. to argue for. And I think it actually, in a way, and this is maybe where I do disagree with Jim, it, it sort of suggests that, that if that's what sort of autonomy means, that, then maybe it was not such a bad idea to sort hmm. of insist on you know, what was insisted on in the 90s and 2000s, that you know, there would be NATO. I mean, the EU is fine as a force if it complements NATO, but this sort of divergence, I think, in the Western alliance is quite concerning, and it's not an isolated incident from the French president. It's part of this pattern over the last few months, which he seems very uh, set on. So, uh, Cassandra, I want to bring in the audience, but I, I have to ask you, uh, you know, is uh, Germany planning to pay up anytime <laughs> soon uh, in, the, in the immortal language of our current policy debate? Feel free to throw money on the table. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember that I have another meeting. Uh, you know, I, I don't have an umbrella, but if I did, you'd be under it. You know? So, uh, actually, we have, uh, we have official, an official answer to that question, which is that the current defense minister, AKK, as she's known colloquially, because even we don't really like eight-word, eight-syllable uh, names, um, uh, Annegret Kamkarabar has said, we won't make it by 2024, as, as agreed upon at the Warsaw Summit, but we will make it by 2031. Now, I mean, Tom's completely right. The 2% the metric is, is pointless, and I think, frankly, for Germany, it's a trap because we're screwed either way. Uh, if we don't pony up, Trump gets angry at us. If we do pony up, everybody will, will say we're getting militaristic and, right. you know, and this is going to be horrible for, you, for the rest of Europe. Uh, I think this is one we don't win. But um, I, I will say this, that, that I think that there is a concerted effort underway in Germany right now by some people, including AKK, to really push the envelope on these issues. Mm -hmm. And not, not so much on the, on the absolute sum as on what is necessary to be, you know, for, for, for us to be able to be a good ally, uh, not just within NATO, but, but with, in particular with regard to our smaller and more vulnerable neighbors uh, who depend on us in many ways, uh, economically and, and, and for security, because in these days, you know, even the big three in Europe can't afford full-spectrum forces, and so they have been specializing in boutique forces for a very long time. And, I mean, I, I think that this, you know, if you look past the strategic autonomy uh, hubris and, and hyperbole, there are a number of things that we ought to be able to do on our own without American support, and that I think we probably can do on our own if we get our act together. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do see a great, of, great deal of movement there, and I, I think that that is to the good. But I think what, what this, what this, America, this um, anniversary moment also teaches us, if, if anything, is, is that we have spent far too long yeah, not focusing on what's necessary to get us through the next 30 years, and, and that really, you know, if we don't do this now, we are facing tremendous future transformations. We, we're, we know exactly what those are. And if we don't do that, you know, they're going to shape us rather than us shaping them. So shameless plug uh, again for Consensus Essay, which you can find mm -hmm. on the Brookings website, which does go into this more. But I do want to bring some questions in from the audience. Please do us a favor. Tell us your name and really make it a question since time is short. Ma'am, go ahead. Yes. Hold on, we do have a microphone. Here. My name is Barbara Dello. Um, you spoke about the need for good allies across the Atlantic. I recently returned from a trip starting in Germany uh, through France, Germany again, um, Basel and Amsterdam, ending in Amsterdam, from crucifixes to windmills. Um, everywhere there were signs of World War II, either in structure, in historical museums, in dialogue, stories of defeat of evil, and um, of the unspoken German question. As an American of German descent, it brought tears to my eyes. Will continued humiliation of German people um, have a negative effect on international relations long term? And um, secondly, uh, is there any question Germany will leave the EU like England did? Um, well, I think that one's for me, right? Okay. Um, well, England hasn't left the EU yet, and it, it, <laughs> I mean, it's beginning to seem, I, I don't know, um, the expert on this is sitting over there, Amanda Sloat, but uh, <laughs> it, it's beginning to seem improbable. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I don't think the Germans have been humiliated at all. I mean, I honestly, I think that we, it was uh, appropriate to hold us to, uh, to, 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 for Germany first to be forced to do an accounting of its guilt, uh, and then to do it on its own, which it did, but it took us a quite, quite a long time. And I would actually argue that part of the, the, the sort of the political turmoil and violence that we're seeing in East Germany right now is rooted in um, some undigested East German history. And, and that still is waiting for an autonomous, you know, free agency accounting. Um, there's a great deal of evidence for that. So, I mean, I, I really, I have to say, I reject that notion that we're being humiliated. I think that, um, if, you know, we needed to do this, and the only way to make our neighbors feel safe was for us to do this. Now, the, the obverse is, of course, that we have been a little smug about this um, and, and complacent. And, and part of this whole sort of amazing grace um, uh, you know, moment is, of course, this is you know, to get back to this theological conceit. The problem is, of course, that, that amazing grace is often mistaken as, in some way, you know, a being chosen by God because you're special, right? Um, and, and so what happened to you is preordained because you're the good guy, and now everybody else should be like you. And, and I have to say it is, I think, not unkind, but in fact quite accurate, sadly, to describe some of Germany's self-image and some of Germany's policies in precisely that framework. Um, I could go on, but I think many of you will understand what I mean. And I think the, 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 the larger point here is, is that uh, we've always had choices. We had choices at the time. We have choices now. And, and what adult people and what adult nations do is exercise those choices responsibly. Okay. Yeah. Go Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, my name is Piotr. I'm English and Russian. So the, um, the events of Berlin have a personal attachment for me. My father was on the Berlin Wall at the time and then left everything to be with my mother when that led to the dissolution of the USSR. Um, so we, say, we like to say from Russia with love, but a bit cliche. So um, anyway, um, my question is something that I asked John Mearsheimer a year ago at um, CSIS. Um, and it relates to, uh, because obviously I would like a, in a diet, in, idealistic world for Russia and the West to be more, uh, should we say, civil. And I asked him, what would it take for that to be the case? And he said, well, there's only one thing that would cause that to occur, and that would be the rise of China. And I just want to know how much that you guys agree with that. It's a good oh, question. Um, sure. You know, I think there's, you know, to come back, to something I said earlier, there's a Russia-China relationship and there's a Putin-Xi relationship, right? And those are different things, um, but they're conflated at the moment. I, I can conceive of a world in which Russia decides that China is uh, more of a threat to it than the West and reorients its, uh, it takes itself in terms of how it pursues its national interests and pursues structural economic reform and it may be a closer relationship to the West. I can't really conceive of a world in which Putin decides to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that as long as he is president of Russia that he is going to flip on China. And I think those who advocate that are maybe trying to channel their inner Henry Kissinger on, <laughs> on all of this. But I don't really see how it works because, you know, ultimately he and she do share the same diagnosis of the threat from sort of global liberalism to their regimes, and that Putin is more worried, I think, about that Western soft power, even more than its hard power, um, than he is of China, and he's just willing to make that compromise. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't, and do you have any? I mean, I, uh, unfortunately now in that, when you think about a, a Russia and China coming together or a Moscow and Beijing coming together, it's very different than the Cold War period where Beijing was the junior partner to Moscow. Now Moscow is the junior partner to Beijing. So I, don't, I frankly don't think with regard to the issues that the free world has with China, I don't think Russia has much to offer us or to help us with that. I, I think what my answer to the, the Mearsheimer point would be a, the thing that will change it is, is a, a Russia where the people of that country decide that they want to go back to 
a win-win relationship with us and with and with Europe, or at least to trying and reject the zero sum. Uh, attitude and the expansionist attitude um, and perhaps the economic difficulties and the sclerotic nature of the country will eventually lead to that kind of change and we'll get a chance to engage again with the people of Russia who I think would rather have a better and closer relationship with us than their leadership is allowing. Okay. Here you go. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report, and I'm, I'm, I've been sitting here thinking to myself, <clears throat> if we sort of take 1989 as the, the high water mark and jump ahead 30 years to today, you, you know, the, the, to me the obvious question is sort of what the hell happened? And, uh, and here we are with liberal democracy and retreat and r- relatively... Uh, mediocre at best leadership in uh, far too many places, et cetera, et cetera. If, if one sort of looks over that period of 30 years, what what uh, three, four, two, whatever it is, key factors got us from 89 to 2019? How, how did this happen? Jim, you want to give the, the condensed history of 30 years? Give us, a, like, three minutes? On well, for, yeah, first of all, I mean, just, just in sort of the big picture of, oh, my God, like, every, you know, we thought everything was going to be great, now everything's terrible. I mean, let, let, we should remember that in Central, Central and Eastern Europe, even with the challenges in places like Poland and Hungary, I mean, these places are so much different in a positive way than they were before the wall came down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's easy for us to uh, forget that. I think, um, I think, again, I would go back to something that I said earlier about how it all seems so easy then that, you know, these regimes are, are falling one by one. You know, uh, Romania was a special case where you had a very bloody outcome at the end of 1989. But otherwise, it just seemed like, gosh, you know, the communists are just giving up and all these people want to be part of the West, and it, and it seemed very easy. So I suppose we should have known, you know, that nothing is, is ever that easy. But, but some of the forces that led to what happened in 89 and 91 and the failures of the communist regimes was the onset of globalization and technological innovation. And there again, you know, if you look back to the rhetoric of the 90s here in this country, about globalization, there was, you know, there was certainly an effort by the Bill Clinton administration to embrace that globalization. Yes, manufacturing jobs are leaving. They're not going to come back. But, you know, we're going to help retrain everybody to become a computer programmer. And they're going to have better jobs than they did before. And that wasn't very easy either. And so the, 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 the inequalities that resulted from the economic changes uh, in that period uh, were something that we did not uh, adequately address. Uh, And then um, I would also say that, you know, from a standpoint of American leadership, the the twin disasters of the 2003 Iraq War and the 2008 financial crisis were just huge blows to... Mm -hmm. American leadership and legitimacy, you know, way people viewed our system. You know, previous, if you look at the financial crisis of the 1990s, the Mexican peso crisis, uh, the Asian financial crisis, the United States was the solver Mm -hmm. of crises. It wasn't the initiator uh, the way it was in 2008. And so, you know, you have that kind of major financial crisis that we started. Uh, The system, you know, people aren't looking at our system thinking, wow, that's so great. Uh, the way that they did uh, in the 1989 to 1991 period. And, I, you know, I think sort of that, that 2003, what we did in Iraq, uh, and uh, 2008 with our um, initiation of the financial crisis uh, were tremendously detrimental to what we were trying to accomplish in the world. Can I, can I add something to that? Um, uh, this is an unfashionable thing to say in this country and to some degree unfashionable back in Europe which is that I think that we, for a while um, in the past 20, 20, 30 years, thought that the architecture and the machinery of governance was going to become irrelevant 
because markets and civil societies were basically going to run things. Um, you know, there was political entropy. We had everybody was going to be like us, and and the sort of you know the hidden hand would run it all. And and I think what we're discovering, particularly as economic integration increases, yeah, is is that you you need a a state and and you need laws and you need institutions and regulations to provide a structure and to provide a sort of supervision over public goods and how they're distributed. This doesn't happen automatically. You know, this, I think, has turned out... The, the, the notion that this would be an automatism has turned out to be a fallacy. But I think that, that, the, that the sort of degradation of the state is greater here than in Europe, but I'm seeing evidence for that even in my own country. You wouldn't think that, but, but I can definitely point to it. And I think that that's something that... That's a conversation that we may need to, you know, that we may need to return to. And interestingly, I mean, and again, it's, I think, something that all Western democracies share, this concern. You know? How do we keep this... How do we fix this machinery? How do we make it... Uh, how do we make it work under these circumstances of increased friction and competition and, and interdependence? I think we're pretty much out of time here. Sorry uh, about that. No, 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 no. It's good. Uh, Toria, do you have any last word? Or? Do you so want us to have I guess last we're all 1989ers. That's the right. phrase that Constanza sure. used. Uh, I, do, wait, maybe... I have one last word, okay. which is, you know, those were the formative years That's right. of, of my professional life, of mm. m- Constanza, all of us. Yeah. Jim's, you guys are slightly younger than we are. I'm not prepared to give up on the optimism mm-hmm. of really? that period, yeah, and exactly. I'm yeah. not ashamed of yeah. what was achieved in terms yeah. of liberating yeah. millions and millions of people and giving them a chance to exactly. shape their own lives. And that is in U.S. interest to continue to expand the community of free nations. Uh, we've just uh, abandon that in a way that we need to come back to in our own interest, I think. All right. I think that's awesome. An unfashionable note of optimism to end this conversation on. And by the way, the word impeachment was never mentioned. (laughs) Well done. (laughs) Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.